Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release. We got a super show for you tonight. If we're playing every video game in order of release in alphabetical order at the end of 1981, then you know we got to the super games. So here's every game that begins with the word super. We last left off with Strategy X in the arcade. So good, so good. And let's move on to our first super game. This is Super Asteroids. It's got to be better than normal asteroids, right? This is on the Exidy Sorcerer, a very obscure, had no idea this existed before doing the channel kind of computer. And you can see how rare this is. This game couldn't find any box art for. Uh, it is by Apollo. The company ma uh, made it as Apollo. But it has a, a very limited release where I couldn't get a lot of stuff. So all we have is this screenshot. Let's pop in and play some Super Asteroids, released at some point in 1981. And this one, just like everything else on the... Um, Everything else on the Exit the Sorcerer, it is cassette tape. So when we boot it up, we're going to hear those lovely cassette tape booting sounds. I'm going to speed this up about 700% faster than what we usually would. If you look at the top left corner, that's how long we kind of be waiting for it. But no way, not this time. There we go. We're in. So this is Super Asteroids. Now it says System Software 2. Maybe Apollo is the developer for this one. Couldn't find a lot of information on it, but it's beginning like an arcade game and it looks really good for something that's trying to pretend it's vector graphics, but using uh, raster graphics. Looks pretty good. All right, so Super Asteroids. Let's see how good it is. Controls are pretty simple. You move the keyboard left, right. Enter is thrusters and then, yep, can fire off uh, shots. So yeah, physics actually working pretty good for the game. It is a very good rendition for home, and it's using what the Exidy Sorcerer excels at the most, I would say, is the resolution. Trying to make you feel like it's almost vector graphics. And it works really good because the Exidy Sorcerer was already black and white, so use asteroids. You don't need any color for this one. Sound effects are really, really simple. But uh, it's pretty typical for the time. I'm just blown away, pal. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. Nice effect of the ship shattering into a bunch of pieces. Yeah, this is a, a really good home way to play Asteroids. The best ones we've seen so far have been the official ones on the Atari home computer. And the Atari... Well, no. I actually didn't give the best scores for the VCS Atari uh, Asteroids. Eh, it, it was a little rough, but the Atari home computer version of Asteroids is top tier. It is extremely good. Yeah, this one plays really well. The only thing, though, is we don't have a joystick. To my knowledge, I'm not aware of a dedicated joystick for the XD Sorcerer. Whenever it didn't get popularity in North America, it did get some popularity in Australia and New Zealand. <laughs> The simple sounds remind me that I'm playing this on... Uh, it makes me feel like I'm playing on a, a PC. So I love it. Yeah, but the physics is is, is very, very good. <laughs> I guess that's our game over sound. <laughs> that's a good point. The arcade used the buttons uh, for turning and thrusting. And, and so, yeah, th th that's true. So using the keyboard, well, the keyboard isn't the same if they had the same co controls around the same spot, but it still plays really well, looks really good. And for an Asteroids game at the time, while it doesn't have any options, two-player mode, and what the Atari home computer did. Oh, we got the UFO. We didn't see it last time. Because Atari had you playing with your friends. You could have four-player simultaneous co-op or competitive play. So uh, Atari is fantastic on the home computer. This one, of course, is just one player, or whoever wants to use the keyboard. You can keep track of your your score and then switch off with a friend and then keep, uh, write down their score. Why not, right? Too cool. All right, that is very, very good for the time. Um, surprised for the Exidy Sorcerer. It works great with the black and white, so I'm going to say of all the games we played, it is definitely above average. It is a four-star game, considering every other computer game you could play with an Asteroids game. It is awesome. So four stars for Super Asteroids. It was super. Let's see our next super game, and it's going to be Astro Fighter. So this one is the sequel, sort of sequel, not really a sequel, to Astro Fighter. 
I don't know if it's just an upgraded version. We last saw this in 1979, I believe, by Data East. So let's take a look at the artwork for Super Astro Fighter. Another one on the Deco cassette system. Got to remember that because anytime you load anything in the Deco cassette system, you have to wait for the cassette to load in the arcade. Your purpose, destroy all UFOs and the Space Master before your fuel runs out. Watch out, your fuel is limited and the Space Master's attack is deadly. How do you play Astro Fighter Part 2? Okay, so in the advertising flyer, they call it Part 2. Use the lever to move your rocket left or right. It's a left, right, and fire space game. You can refuel after you've destroyed many UFO formations and the Space Master. I'm guessing that's what it is on the advertising flyer. Your game is over when your rockets have been destroyed. And there's a terrible picture of the arcade cabinet. Couldn't come across a really clean one of this one. And then if you look at the PCB, the, this is the Data East or the Deco cassette system right there in the center. So whenever you want to switch out games, you just have to have a different cassette and pop in. It is one of the best things for arcade operators at the time. <laughs> yeah, right. Now it's 1981. So if if you did want to look back at the video we did on just Astro Fighter, the, the, the uh, differences just make this one a little bit more difficult, faster bullets and so forth. But it's kind of like a hacked or an upgrade version is what we could describe it today. Here's our controls. It's the same we've seen with Astro Fighter. Move left, right. And then we have uh, fire and bombs, I believe, as the two, uh, the two buttons on the right. Yeah, they didn't give us the... Uh, usual controls that we see. All right, so let's go to the arcades and we're going to Japan because it's time to play Super Astro Fighter by Data East. The better Astro Fighter, or maybe we'll see. Oh, and I forgot we're using the Deco cassette system, so hold up. We got to go to where we can speed this sucker up. Otherwise, we'll be waiting all day. Let's go again to Super Astro Fighter. So we're going to get this thing going up to about 600% faster. Someone asked a good question with the Deco cassette system. If your whole arcade had nothing but cabinets that had the Deco cassette system and then the power went out, does that mean everybody would have to wait? What is this? A hundred something seconds uh, for the, well, it's even longer than that because it's a hundred, but it's not full seconds until you could play any games. There we go. Super Astro Fighter. After all the space games we played, this would fit in just fine. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It, it kind of uh, messes up the illusion of that we're in the arcade. J just, just pretend. It's uh, 1981, but we had to fast forward it because we're not going to be here all night. So the attract mode is kind of cool. It's shooting the letters of Super Astro Fighter. Try to get a high score to register your name as the best five fighters. And this plays, if you look at the top of the screen, just like Astro Fighter did, every round has a wave of enemies that come in. And the top of the screen shows you the kind of wave of enemies you'll see. And the farther you get, you'll be able to see that next wave of enemies. All right, so let's put a coin in. And push player one start. Let's go. Now I'm wondering what the other control is, because the only other button I have to attack right now is... I just have one. There's nothing else that's responding for attack. But notice how they're doing kind of an homage to Space Invaders here, where the enemies, depending on whatever round you're on, they get faster and faster, and they get closer and closer. Not because of hardware limitations, but just because they could. Oh, I guess we did a suicide attempt that time. <laughs> Do they really need fuel management? I, I, I wouldn't think so. Oh, wow. Yeah, different patterns for the enemies. Pretty cool. It still kind of reminds me of a game we would have played in the late 70s as a space game. Look at the star field in the background, scrolling. And I can see the difficulty is a little bit tougher, just slightly. They tweaked it a little bit. Oh, we're already done. So three lives and that's it. <laughs> they did change that up. That's pretty nice. Let's flash the screen so you can feel proud. Oh, that's nice. Wait a second. We're playing on a four-way joystick, but I was oh, I'm only able to move left and right. That's funny. Every one of these arcade systems costs money, so whatever joystick you have, you have a, if you get an eight-way joystick, that's more money. Let's go put a coin in and push and start. So they paid for a four-way joystick 
instead of just a two-way. But yeah, all I, I guess they did that for the, entering your initials in. Whenever you play the game, though, you just move left and right. And then move on to round two. If you look at the top of the screen, it's going from right to left. So the first wave of enemies is done. Whatever's flashing at the top is the next wave of enemies. With an example of what you'll see. We even have one that looks like a TIE Fighter. And it's making us repeat. So if we die, it doesn't matter how much, how much money we have. Uh-oh, it's cloning itself? That's not good. <laughs> cool attack patterns. It's stuff we've seen, though, from the late 70s. We're very spoiled here on Chronologically Gaming. We've, we've seen Galaga, which is the newest, hottest 1981 space game. And man, oh man, is it good. When you compare the animation of the invaders in Galaga to, to this, it's... It's it's incredible. Oh, we got a new new guy. That's awesome. Is it only one thousand points gets you a new guy? And it's one bullet. So if you miss the shot, that's that's it. You gotta wait. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's pretty cool. I like the pseudo 3D effect they got going there. Oh, and then we... Uh, <laughs> so we did make it to round four, but for Super Astro Fighter, it's very nuanced of what really changed from uh, Astro Fighter. Uh, not enough really to push it into the big leagues of the other space games we played, and we played a ton. So for this game, for this title, I'd still say... It's around the average range, considering every every game we played. If Chet wants to to jump in and throw out some some votes, because I would say it's perfectly average for 1981. Uh, it, I could go three and a half, maybe slightly above average, but it's still around the range that it's not doing something to uh, make it super impressive. So um, yeah, I'll say three and a half sounds good. Just slightly above average for Super Astro Fighter. It's super, not just not super enough. All right, let's continue, continue forward with our next Super game. Next game is Super Cubes, which we played Slip, and this is the other game part of this compilation. It just has two games that we, we separated for the show, and if you can see the front of the box, Super Cubes and Slip. Super Cubes, obviously, is we're playing a Rubik's Cube game, and it's, it boasts that it's over 300 game variations. I think they're talking about the variation of the cube, because there's no way this has 300 game variations. We have a manual as well for this one that we checked out for Slip. So Super Cubes is the ingenious cube game. I guess they can't use the word Rubik. On the computer, you choose between three sizes of cube, nine levels of difficulty. Computer then jumbles the cube and the puzzle is set. See how long it takes to restore the cube. Player keeps time. Check on your progress and records the number of moves you make. Now this would be the, I believe, third, maybe fourth Rubik's Cube game we played is all the rage in the 80s. And this isn't going to be the last. We're going to see lots of these. We can breeze by how to load the program. But how do you play? So whenever you begin the game, you start with a 2x2 two two cube. If you want it larger, you can press Option, which is one of the buttons on your Atari home computer. And then if you press Select, you can have different skill levels, and then start when you're ready to play. And then to rotate it, you use the joystick. So we're on the Atari home computer, which means we can plug in the VCS joystick and play. All right, let's pop in and play some Super Cubes. Released at some point in 1981 by Thorn EMI Video. All right, here we go. Super Cubes. So I can hit Option, as this is me pushing Option, and it makes the cube bigger. And then it looks like you have just those three different levels. So we'll do something like simple here. And then if you push the Select button on your on your computer, you can set up different skill levels. What do we got? Seven, eight, nine, and uh, this box also came with another game with it so but i still don't see how it can add up to 300 game variations and when you press start to go let's see how it works with the joystick so i have the atari joystick in eight-way digital joystick and i can move up and down this is me just moving up and down on the joystick and then to move left and right spins it around nice 
Oh man, it feels fresh though to do use this on an Atari joystick. And yeah, you solve the cube. We're doing a really easy one here. I was looking to see how easy it was to play. Now the 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 last few we played were a little cumbersome. We played one that was only keyboard. It was it was pretty difficult. And then we played others that tried using joystick, but this one works really well. So if you were into a Rubik's Cube and wanted to play a game on your home computer, this would be the best one so far that you could play. Yeah, they make it really simple to with that Atari joystick. So I'm not doing anything with the red button. All you do is hold the joystick, move it the way you want. It works really well. Sweet. That's Super Cubes. Not the last Rubik's Cube game. We're just getting started. Remember, it's 1981. It's going to get more and more popular as time goes on. And uh, for this one, of all the games we played, it's broken apart between Super Cubes and Slip. You know, this is this, if you bought this, you would have gotten both games at the same time. But um, Super Cubes, I'd still say, is around... Uh, I'd say around average for the time. Three stars for Super Cubes. Uh, the control makes it really easy to play a game that you... you, you with the other ones we played, I would have rather had a Rubik's Cube in the palm of my hand rather than playing on a computer. But this one, this one works pretty good. <laughs> yeah, right? Well, it depends on if you wanted the novelty for it or not. Because think of the price. What's the price of the Rubik's Cube? Are you willing to pay more for the price of a Rubik's Cube or a video game that you play on the computer for a Rubik's Cube? I, I, I don't know. I, I think it'd be more in intellectual or educational to have the actual physical object than the one on the computer. But uh, we're here to play video games. All right, let's move on to our next super game. Next one we got is Super Moon Cresta. Another one that is not even really related to Moon Cresta. We're all familiar with Moon Cresta. This has been copied several, several times. So this is Super Moon Cresta. Let's take a look at the advertisement flyer. We've launched a new moneymaker, Super Moon Cresta. Moon Cresta was launched. Excitement that was out of the world. Now here's Super Moon Cresta. A world of new, <laughs> new action added to the game for players. A world of new profit built in for you. And this is by Sega Gremlin. There's the example of the arcade cabinet. And then the controls are just left, right, and fire. Like we did with most shooters. And then the arcade marquee. Really epic. Now, this one's a little interesting because the original creator of Mooncresta was Nihon Busan, or Nichibutsu. And this game, they took the exact example of that, or well, they had the rights to it, but then they just pretty much hacked it. So, so Super Mooncresta is just a faster, harder version of Mooncresta. A few palette swaps, really nuanced, small things that make it different. But uh, Nichibutsu says this isn't really theirs. It's not a sequel to Mooncresta. It's not even part of the same series of games. They, well, they don't consider it that way. The, the, what the original makers did. So if you look at the manual, this is a, a purely a creation by Gremlin Sega, taking what Moon Cresta is and then turning it into their own their own thing. And I believe the manual has yeah, it's just technical information for us. So nothing there. We played Moon Cresta. We we got the gist. Is it super though? Let's find out and see. We're going to the arcades again in Japan to check out Super Moon Cresta, released at some point in 1981. Whether it's super or not, it, it's Mooncrest. It's got to be really good. If it's using the same or similar PCB, let's see what happens. <laughs> okay, here we go. Make rockets dock. Yeah, that's right. You can do that with the different play mode. Mooncrest is one of the first space games or shooters that we played that you change the game up with something different. All right, let's put a coin in and see just how super it is. It might be so hard that... It's going to super kill me. Oh yeah, I love it. Sound effects are fantastic. I'm not going to say anything about the difficulty because as soon as I say, oh, it's not that big a deal, then it's going to get crazy hard on me. <laughs> but the uh, color sound is excellent. It sounds exactly like Mooncrested, too. Slight palette swap here and there, but... If you have not seen Mooncrested or get the gist of it, whenever you die, you take over the next type of ship, which is the upgraded ship. If you survive long enough, though, you can do the docking sequence without losing a life, and your ship gets upgraded. Yeah, now we get to dock slowly, nice and easy. I 
nice and easy. Right on. <laughs> yeah, most of the same sound is there, too. So even though uh, Nichibutsu says this isn't official, it, it pretty much sounds exactly like we're playing Mooncrest and all. See? You don't pay attention for one second and a bullet snipes you. Oh gosh, now we get the asteroid phase. Oh yeah, see, now the larger you get, you're, bi you're a bigger target, so it's harder to play. I.e. whenever you die, even though you get more shots, it's still pretty difficult. Alright, so initials doesn't use the four-way joystick. Gotta scroll all the way to the end. And we're in the high score. Because we're the first one here. The first time the cabinet had booted up. And I stand corrected. I believe we are not in Japan because Sega well no, Sega Gremlin. It's it's possible this was released in other regions since Sega Gremlin were the uh, the creators of this one. Uh, not necessarily uh, Nichibutsu. And let's go again. Putting a coin in and pushing start. Playing this in 1981 after all the space shooters we've, 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 we've checked out, this one still feels right at home with everything else. If I went to the arcade uh, with uh, Galaga, Frogger, Donkey Kong, and so forth, this this still is amazing. Or the original Mooncrest is still amazing. Where's my 1981 gamers at? You gotta remember the patterns. Once you memorize the patterns, then you're golden. Alright, so even though we died, we have now still a pretty tiny ship, but firepower has increased. And they did make the shots move a little faster than Mooncrest, so just slightly. We're not playing these back-to-back, -back, so it's hard to get every nuance of the game. Alright, time to dock. <laughs> I didn't think it was right on, but they made it right on. Thanks. Now, we are a huge target. If one of these shoots a bullet, we're going to get... See, right there? Gosh, yeah. The, the, the bullet speed's a little bit faster, but still loads of fun to play. Asteroids destroy us. Player one, you are over. So that was Super Moon Cresta. It is really not necessarily super. It's doing little things to make it a, a, a better. So, uh, but for the time, still a space shooter from for 1981. I'm still going to say it's an above average. Well, let me think of all the other space shooters we played. Yeah, I still consider this an above average title, even though we're we're kind of comparing it to just Moon Cresta. So, you know, I see a 2 there, possibly a 3, yeah, so it's, I'm a big fan of Moon Cresta, and because it fits so well with everything else we've seen up to this point, I'll still say 3.5 stars. It's still there, still looking good. Alright, let's press forward and see our next Super game. It's Super Slither. Let's check out Super Slither for the Commodore VIC-20. Starting with the box. This one's part of another compilation with uh, Space Math, <laughs> Biorhythm, Car Chase, which we didn't, I don't think we checked out Biorhythm or the, um, or we didn't do Blue Minis from Outer Space. So we played all these individually, and this is Super Slither with our cassette tape. For other versions, okay, we just had the two different ones. Let's pop in Super Slither on our Commodore VIC 20 and play at some point in 1981. This is by Jim Butterfield. Way to go, Jim. Do we want instructions? Yes. Wait, I said yes, and I went right into the game. So I have my Commodore VIC-20 joystick plugged in, and it's working. So maybe I didn't need instructions. Maybe it was a joke. Do you want instructions? Yes, yes, we would like instructions. Here's the game. And it's, it's Hustle. We've seen s since the 70s. One of your snake variant games. Here's the thing, though. We've seen this with two players simultaneous. We've even seen this with four players. 
simultaneous. And this is a one player game. Do we want another game? Okay, sure. So if you want to play a solo version of Super Slither and I actually don't like how long it waits to load in when the, a bonus comes in. Yeah, I'm waiting a, roughly a second before it comes in, so it kind of messes up the gameplay. So it's okay, but not really the best. I'm going to say this one's a, a subpar game considered the other ones we've seen. If It's a one-player title, too. So if you think of all the other games we played up to this point, it's... It's still a two star. It's 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 a bad game. We'll say the best of the bad. Two stars for Super Slither, considering the other games we've seen up to this point. All right, and with that, let's press forward and see our next Super game. The next game is Super Slot, also for the Commodore VIC-20. For Super Slot, like we do with other casino games, fruit games, slot machines, we're just gonna breeze right by it. I believe a zero star rating is what we would usually say, but I'm just gonna say half star. If you were really into the casino and wanted to play some fruit slot machine in your Commodore VIC-20, this is the one for you. The quintessential 1981 game. But for us, considering every other game we played, nope. Moving on, let's go to our next title. It is, yeah, there we go, Super Tank. Now we're talking. So let's go back to the arcade and check out Super Tank. Starting with the advertisement flyer. Now we got several. This game was originally developed in Germany. And this is the German advertisement flyer. Two different games, two players simultaneously. Or, I'm sorry, it's, it's just translated in uh, three different languages. But uh, I don't know what they're going on with the, the artwork here. It looks like a children's title. Like we're a friendly tank. We even have flowers on the tank. Like they don't want it to be dangerous. No no German children should be, should be playing war games. And then we have a different one also in Germany. This one looks uh, like a great 1980s advertising flyer. It even has a screenshot from the title screen when we boot up the arcade cabinet. That's, that's just the front of the arcade cabinet. And then the back of the other... <laughs> this is the back of the advertising flyer. This is by Video Games and the two different arcade cabinets, but <laughs> I don't know what, why they turned it into a, a children's tile. Maybe it's because it's in, in Germany. And then the back of the other one has a screenshot examples. The premiere of Super Tank. Now, for North America, this is the advertising flyer we got for Super Tank. And you can see it's by Video Games West Germany 1981. And they uh, say this when we boot the game up, specifically West Germany when it came out. Oh, man. And we flip it over to the back. By the way, what is going on with this? <laughs> this is the one of the worst advertiser flyers. All it has is the name, the title, and then a, a woman peeking behind a curtain, but you don't even see the game. So it doesn't really sell anything. Whoever did the, the advertisement in North America, uh, they, they need a new job. <laughs> we flip it over in the back, though, or one of the, the other advertisement flyer, and then we see a German description of how to play. I do not speak German or read German, but it, it, for this game, we can figure it out. This one's really cool because it's a two-player simultaneous, if you want to, co-op game, kind of like a top-down maze game where you collect the dots, but then if you finish the whole level out, then you get to fight the super tank. So it's not just the title of the, the game. It is one of the enemies. It is a boss, a giant tank. There's the example of the arcade cabinet for Super Tank, our PCB, and you see the controls are we have an eight-way joystick, move around and fire. Easy as that. We got the manual as well, Super Tank manual. When it was released in North America, CompuTran did the rights, or not the rights, it did the distrib distribution, and Video Games was the original developer in Germany. How do you play? Your tank moves in all directions, even backwards. You score points by wiping out green mines and eliminating red tanks, and wiping out the last mine on screen, score super bonus with direct hit of nozzle of the super tank. Diamonds of super armor will, pr will protect you briefly. Each new screen presents greater challenges and score. Match the skill with a friend by playing simultaneously. That's right. And I believe that's it, at least for game concept. All right, we're going to Germany and checking out the arcade. This is Super Tank, released at some point in 1981 by Video Games. Great title. So right here on the attract mode, down at the bottom, letting us know video games made it in West Germany. Very nice. I like to wait a little bit on the attract mode because this is what you'd see first in the arcade before you decide to put your money in. I know we're just made of money here on Chronologically Gaming, but back in 1981, you were a little more selective which game you were going to play. And attract mode lets you know, do I want to put money in to play this or not? Now, I don't have anybody else with me this evening, but if we did, we could play simultaneous two tanks going on at the same time. And I believe you can't shoot each other. Uh, I'll, I'll try it out just to see. 
but you can jump in with a friend and what you're doing is collecting all uh, the dots on the screen to move on to the next phase. <laughs> nope, there's no women holding sheets in the game. We've been lied to. All right, let's put a coin in and play some Super Tank. One or two player. Let's go. So the green parts, you can see, I just can walk over. Oh man, now the controls take a little bit to get used to. I thought I was to be able to move a little freely, but <laughs> you can see the tank. Yeah, that's that's interesting. The 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 tank is is able to move backwards. So whenever I let me try my best to describe it, when I am facing the left side and then I turn t uh, t to the right, I'm not going to turn. I'm actually going to just back up. So it feels a little bit strange the first time you play. All right, put another coin in and push and start. <laughs> Do we just? Oh, nice. So it's invincibility. Okay, I'll take that. The red looks like it might be... It's doing some kind of countdown. All right, so here, I'll, I'll explain the joystick. I'm going to the left. As soon as I move to the right, watch what happens. It backs up first. Until you decide to make another move. Uh-oh. <laughs> So controls, uh, they're a little rough. When you played something, so many maze games that we played, having a game that doesn't, work, yeah, the the game doesn't feel as smooth as other maze games we've, we've played. And we've seen controls for tank games that have the actual tank controls. You know, you turn left and then it uh, turns your tank left. But this one is trying something really different. I don't know how I'm gonna do the super tank with this. Man, but I love that power up. It's invincibility, just a brief time. Let's see if we can finish up and see the super tank. Let's go. How big is the boss? Oh my gosh. That was fast. If you blinked, you missed it. That was the super tank. Simultaneously, he shot and killed us. Or maybe we caught him first. That was so quick. But a little underwhelming. I was expecting the super tank to be bigger. We've seen bigger bosses than that before, right? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't wasn't a fair fight. We are just a tank though, and they are super tank. All right, let's put another coin in. Go again. Let's see if I can play longer. I I know the super tank is supposed to be very difficult, but not whenever you can't even get a shot in. All right, let's see if we can blow him up, and we're gonna make our way across the bottom. Presentation, this is pretty typical for 1981, but the controls are not typical for 1981. I gotta say, that's the biggest draw for Super Tank. We're also playing top down fixed screen. You know, it's not changing up the formula too much. Let's see if we can get to that. No way, it ran out just at the same time. All right, go, go, go. <laughs> oh my gosh. This is probably why you need someone to help you out. All right, where is he? Where is he at? Let's see if we can just dodge him and keep him on the screen for a while. <laughs> now, you can't beat up the super tank. Wait a second. Is this like a western where... Oh my gosh, yeah. It fires really fast. What if I move to the top? <laughs> he just fires really quick. So it's almost like you're doing a western where you have to draw your gun faster, but in a tank. So I get it, that's pretty cool. All right, now, of all the games we played, when we do the rating system, we base it on we're in 1981, we don't know anything else except games from 1981. And then we also take the major places of where you can play games. Like in the arcade, has its own separate rating system than if you play on a handheld, obviously. We're not gonna rate them the same. This game, considered to, uh, other arcade games, really isn't very impressive. If you think of all the other games we've seen at the time and the arcade games, the uh, gameplay is where I say it has the biggest fault, the way that had the controls. And that's one of the things we hold to the most for how the game is compared to others. So I'm not gonna say it's like super bad, but it is below par. So I'm gonna say two and a half stars for Super Tank. It is not that super considering the other games we played.
<laughs> All right, so let's move on and see our next game. Our next super game is Super Wumpus for the ZX81. All right, let's check out Super Wumpus starting with the box. This is by Silversoft. Is it better than Wumpus? Is this all we get? No, we get also the cassette, which has side A and side B. And let me tell you, this one was really difficult to get to work because on a ZX81, to flip the tape over, you have to insert certain commands. And I tried to find ways to play the game without having to flip the tape over because most emulators either don't have that ability to flip the tapes over or you have to flip the tape over and know the codes to, to type in. So I finally found uh, a copy of someone that posted this on uh, a ZX81 stuff. Dot UK, and we are able to play Super Wumpus because it's Wumpus. You can't you can't just skip out on Wumpus. All right, here we go. This is Super Wumpus for the ZX81, released at some point in 1981. <laughs> you are playing Super Wumpus, another fantastic game from Silversoft. I don't believe we've played any other games by Silversoft, but maybe they're all fantastic. What level of play do we want? Let's start easy. We never played before. Let's do one. What cave pattern do we want? We'll say one. They give us three different options. That's nice. Select supplies. How many arrows do we want? We want a bunch. Ten. If we can carry ten, let's do it. How much food do you want? Oh, if we can do 40 kilograms, we're doing the max. We've learned our lesson. We got to have food. Select the game. Enter a number in range of... Okay, so you can do randomized games, which is usual. The, the, the whole point of the original Wumpus that was on mainframe computers is every maze is different. Every time you play is a different experience. So they're letting us know there's you know 255 different variations. We can say what variation we want or just say zero for a random game. So you know what? We're going rando. <laughs> That's right. You should be able to. This one that we got is makes it so that there is no flip that needs to happen. You just can keep playing. So essentially, they've done it. They, they, they did make it work. All right, so it says that we're, this, we're in a dark place right now. Okay, so this is more reminiscent to the original Wumpus. Now, it does have some graphics at the top, just a little bit. Uh, the original was text only, but this is letting you choose options. So now that we're in, we're in room 19, I believe, and then we can choose to go left, right, or can we go down to 10? I'm not sure, but we can, uh, we, we have different commands, audit, drop, escape, feed, gather, move, shoot, rest, or quit. Which, what's the difference between escape and quit? Maybe that's if you're surrounded by a bat. But if we do audit, what does that mean? What does audit do? The story so far. We have 10 arrows, our food, time taken, energy, time left. Okay, so it just gives us a status update. That's what audit means. And then if we go move, let's go. It's going to ask what to do, right? Where are we going to move next? Yeah, which direction? Let's go left. Room 13. This plays in typical fashion of what I would expect from a ZX81 game. Slow, need to wait a little bit for the cassette. Well, the cassette actually did all the loading. It's just uh, taken a while for us to move to each room. <gasps> I feel a draft. I do feel a draft. Now that we're here, can we feed? Let's feed. Eat some of our food. How many kilograms do you want to eat? One kilogram. Maybe I should have used decimals. Eating one kilogram of food, I don't think that's good. All right, let's do left again, or move. Where's our command? And let's go left. Again, we were spoiled on Chronologically Gaming because we played um, the uh, Hunt the Wumpus for the um, TI-99, and that one was a beautifully graphic, playable, easy do you, oh, we already, <laughs> yeah, we already died really fast. And so this one is more typical of, of the original one. But so you want to try again, answer yes or no. Yes. Do we want to try again? Oh, we got to type Y-E-S. Yes, we do. And we do the same commands before. Man, we died fast already. I'm going to try one more time, but I'm pretty sure this is as far as we'll get. It doesn't look like as far as, as, far as the gameplay, how slowly it uh, loads to be able to play against or find the Wumpus. Same key pattern. I believe this is when we flip the tape over and then go for 10 arrows, 40 kilograms of food, load us up, and then do again random, randomize us. Let's go. Word room number one. 
It's dark over there. <laughs> yes, yeah, Super Wumpus, where you die faster. The smell's getting stronger. Look out, it's the Wumpus. It has not seen you. Wait, the Wumpus is here already? Let's shoot. Just take a shot in the dark. If we started the game right next to the Wumpus, it'd be really funny. Okay, shoot right. Did we kill the Wumpus? Okay, the arrow's been fired. Now entering room number 10, 1, 8, 13, 8. Oh, that's right. It passed through all the rooms. No, it didn't do anything. So we didn't shoot in there. Let's shoot again. We got enough arrows. Let's shoot left. If the Wumpus is this close, we can do it. Is he here? Okay, the arrow's been fired. Entering room 8, 15, 18, 15. We didn't get any Wumpus? No. So... Imagine it's 1981. You sit down at your ZX81 to play this game. This is the experience you would you would have for someone that wanted to play a strategy game. You're trying to hunt them down, and what we did is fire the arrow, and it's passing from room one, eight, and it's going, continuing in that direction. And we obviously didn't hit anything. What I want to know is it's telling us left and right, but it doesn't say down. I guess that would be because we, we, we used the cardinal directions, you know, north, south, east, and west. But this this isn't telling us do we shoot south. So I wonder if I say shoot down, if it'll shoot down to room five. Let's just see. Does down work? No, down does not. What about south? South doesn't work. Either. Okay, well, then I'm wondering how you would move to the next room to the south. But regardless, Super Wumpus is a Super Wumpus game because it has a little bit of graphics compared to the mainframe version. So if you just went from playing the, the mainframe to this one at home, it would be a luxury, which I'm sure you can find hard to believe. Considering all the other games we played up to this point, especially since we played Hunt the Wumpus on a home computer, this one is a subpar computer experience. Uh, for the ZX81, though, it would be higher up on the list for sure. Now, uh, I'm going to say it's still a bad game considering the other games we've seen for the time. The, the the little slowdown in between and, and not necessarily getting your commands quick enough. I'll say two stars for Super Wumpus. Again, not super. It's it's super compared to a mainframe computer, but for a home, com home computer, no. Two stars. All right, so let's press forward and see our next super game. All right, here we go. So this one is Super ZX80 Invasion. Now, just for fun kind of a inside joke on the channel. I said, every time that this system comes up, I'm gonna call it the ZX80 and make it sound as yank as possible. So all the people in the UK just cringe. Ugh. And everything everything past this, I say it my best Clive Sinclair impression, the ZX81 or the ZX Spectrum. And this is the very first system. And now this game is the very last game we're ever going to be showcasing on the channel. Super ZX, <laughs> Super ZX80 Invasion. And this is another game that we cannot play ourselves. It is essentially a Space Invaders clone. So for the time, while this won't load because it's uh, one of those systems we weren't able to uh, copy or emulate, sadly, I'm still going to give this one low marks because uh, if you've seen the gameplay, the frame rate is, is abysmal. And considering the other games we've seen for the time, it, this is the, the, the final farewell of the ZX80 in UK. This was discontinued in 1981, and so, ladies and gentlemen, we say a very fond farewell to the ZX80, because here moving forward, especially next year, it is time for the ZX81 and the Z ZX Spectrum to shine. All right, now we go to our next game. This is Super Cobra for the VIC-20, the final of our Super Games of the evening. Now, Super Cobra is just Super Slither. This is all it is. The reason why I showed it here is because this is the Germany release of Super Slither. The same people, the uh, same person designed it, same game, everything's the same except it's in German handwriting. I put it here because Super Cobra is a very popular arcade game, and someone took the name Super Cobra, so there's, there's people in Germany that played it, and they recognize Super Cobra as not a horizontally scrolling shooter, but as this. And I wonder if this was like a, a term they used in Germany as this is a Super Cobra game because, you know, you're not a snake, you're a cobra. But anyway, it's the same we said before. It is subpar, two and a half stars for Super Cobra. Whether you're in Germany or in other parts of the world. All right, and with that, let's press forward and see our next game. All right, now it's time to go to... France to play the Philips video pack. Video. Video pack. Le jeu vidéo Philips. 60 programmes de jeux différents avec des milliers de variantes.
Le jeu vidéo Philips, sans cesse de nouveaux programmes passionnants. Philips Video Pack, votre jeu vidéo. Video Pack. Yeah. So we're going to France to play Syracuse. This one's an interesting one. I think the only one that we found that you can play it is in 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 French. So if you look at the front of the box, it is totally different than any other uh, Philips video pack game we've played. Most of them were following a formula saying which cassette kind it was, but no, totally different and a very obscure idea for a video game. So if you look at the front of the box, they have like a cartoon. Uh, it's based on uh, historical events. And it, it looks like they, they did more of an art style, like a, a drawing, not going for something super uh, fancy like the Magnavox Odyssey 2 or Atari. And then if we look at the cartridge, it looks totally different as well. Because this is by Joe Pack for the Philips Video Pack. And this one has different game modes that you can play. <laughs> Same handle at the top. It's too crazy. All right, so we have a manual as well. This one is a manual that's made by itself because I couldn't find the actual scan of this one. It's in different languages, so we're going to breeze down to English. Pass the controls. Pass German. All right, here we go. So the year is 213 BC. The town of Syracuse in southern Sicily. <laughs> Say that five times fast. Was besieged by the troops of the Roman consul Marcellus. The battle lasted three years, giving Archimedes time to perfect his ingenious system for defending Syracuse. Archimedes' idea was to reflect the sun off a mirror onto the enemy ships. The sunlight reflected in this way could be con con uh, concentrated enough to set fire to the Roman warships. Despite a heroic defense, the Romans won. As for Archimedes, he was so absorbed in geometry problem when the Romans landed, he was killed by a Roman soldier because he refused to answer his questions. How is that for a story of a video game? You take something from 213 BC, one example of a besieged city, and make that into a game. That's 1981 for you. The Wild West of video games. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right, so the startup is, we have four different game or game variations it says here. And the way the game is, you actually have to have two people. So I'm going to get a second controller plugged in. And one player is going to be controlling Archimedes at the top of the walls with a mirror. And then the other person is going to be controlling three Roman galleys that appear in formation. And you essentially just have to get the Roman galleys to the other side. The other person has to deflect the sun at the enemy. So while that sounds cool in practice, how in the world did they do that? And it'd be funny to know if the the game was made up because someone had the idea and told a programmer to make it happen, or was the programmer that had the idea? Because I just think it'd be funny for the game idea to come from someone's head and say, okay, make, it that, make that a video game. Can you, can you reflect the sun onto enemy ships in a video game? All right, here we go. So um, I want to bear in mind everyone that's on the stream or watching on YouTube, this game uh, did not emulate correctly, and there's a lot of flashing. So anyone sensitive to flashing lights, please close one eye or, or look away. This one is uh, uh, something I couldn't get perfected. So we're just going to be showing a little bit of kind of how it works. Let's go with game variation number one. And you can see the flashing is real. I'm now player one at the top of the, the tower as Archimedes moving left and right. It's funny that my character looks just like any other thing we played on Magnavox Odyssey 2 or Phyllis Video Pack. But I can use the joystick to angle the mirror, and the sun's rays continue to bounce off. I can even bounce them back at the sun. So you just re-angle re your mirror and move Archimedes left and right, and that's all you do as player one. Now, player two takes the ships and moves the ships forward <laughs> without trying to get destroyed by Archimedes. And so all you do is take your joystick, control the three different ships, and move them across. You can do them one at a time. It depends on how you angle your joystick. But you can only move one at a time. And then eventually, whenever you get to the ships to the far side, then you win. So it's a, a two-player versus, versus game to play. The concept is what blows my mind. You're going to re reflect uh, sunlight onto ships to catch them on fire. So cool. <laughs> and then you can see, because we got uh, one of our ships there, we have an enemy that's now out on the right side. And when you get enough enemies all, all the way to the other side, then you win, and then they base your, you know, how fast you did it on your score. All right, so to not <laughs> have everybody get nauseous from all the flashing, uh, Syracuse is an excellent 
uh, idea executed for how a, a, an asinine uh, using something like this this story for it. But for um, the, the games we played for the time, two pit player competitive is always fun. It has um, uh, the, the the feeling of a, a very simple Atari game. So I'd say it's it's a great average game for the time. I really couldn't say above average, considering the other ones we've seen. Um, but it is. Uh, let me think. If we do the yeah, we'll, I will say this one is above average. Three and a half stars for Syracuse. If you have a buddy to play with, it'd be it'd be a lot of fun to be able to try to get your ships to the other side, and then the reflection of the the, the sunlight's pretty cool. All right, so after that, let's see what our next game is. All right, from one computer to another, this is the TRS-80, and you're in for a real treat. This is Talking Adventure 1, Forbidden Planet, Part 1. All we have is an advertisement flyer for Forbidden Planet. The first talking adventure is what it says here. This adventure talks through the cassette port. You no longer need to have voice synth synthesizer. This adventure takes you to a desolate planet where only your skill and talking computer will help you survive. This is part one of a multi-part talking adventure. Like no other adventure you've ever played, the first five people to solve Forbidden Planet will get the next adventure free. Quick, we better solve it <laughs> and send it in. So they break down what the game has, split screen, machine language, and then this will be 40 bucks at the time. And look at that, 48K on your TRS-80. That is a big old chunk of change from 1981. And that's all we have as far as our word goes. Couldn't find the box for this one. Kind of hard to come by, but this one's special because this is the very first time we're going to have an adventure game talk to us. Here we go. At some point in 1981 by William DeMa. Way to go, William. This is Forbidden Planet Part 1. Now, this does have a little bit of loading, but the draw is it's going to talk. And we've already seen the TRS-80 talk to us, but that would be for action games. This makes me think of the precursor of graphic adventure games talking, talking to us. Welcome to adventure. <laughs> And we do not have fast forward on this one. So this would be exactly what you would experience My back then. <laughs> Every line that comes in for the talking, you would have to wait for that. And there, there's nothing I can do. Like, uh, well, I, I guess if we were able to speed up the emulator, we could. But this is what you would be experiencing in 1981. Written by William Demas. If you had this as a kid, you'd be like, oh my gosh, the computer is talking to me. I am flipping out, man. At this point, if you... There he is. So Dick Barker is the voice. Thanks, Dick. So this this game, if you were a techie nerd and you had lots of stuff on your TRS-80, you most likely have already had the program that does just talk to you, but there's not any game involved. It's it's just using the voice synthesizer. So here we go. It even t t talks to us when we want to load the game. Oh my gosh. So we'll say, no, we want to play. Do you want to activate voice? Yes. That's why we're here. So there you go. It doesn't uh, speak with everything. It's it's when I first played this, I thought that when it said it was everything was going to talk, it was just going to read all the lines out. But it doesn't do that. It just has small snippets of things that they they say, like the alert cruiser malfunction, ship alarm is sounding. What should I do? So can we go down? Oh here, down. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I can't go that way. Can we look again? Give me the look. Ship alarm is sounding. Can we go west? Sorry. East. Sorry. North. Sorry. Look alarm. What? <laughs> what? So even even though it is just a, it's a two word text parser game, even though we were playing on that, the game is still talking to us. Like what? What do you what do you mean? What are you talking about? But it's still talking to us. A, a talking adventure game. Incredible. So we can can we go in any direction? Sorry. Up. Ship alarm is sounding. So if we can't go any direction, Sorry. north, south, did I do every west? Sorry. <laughs> south. Sorry. 
Uh, read. Nothing special. Push. Alarm. <laughs> the computer's like, what? What did you say? Yeah, so it's it's only giving you certain samples that it reads off. It's not everything is being read off, which I think if it did that at this time, it would be even slower because it's just having little quips here and there. Okay, so we're here in the beginning. I'm in a plastic cylinder. Uh, open. Uh, look. Cylinder. Still nothing. Alarm is sounding. Good thing it doesn't have an alarm sound for us. Go alarm. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, look. Alarm. Oh man. See, it's already theirs now. <laughs> exit. Cylinder. I don't know how to exit something. Uh, now, if we don't have any direction to go and we don't have... What about inventory? Do we got inventory? I'm carrying nothing at all. At least that works. What about health? Examine your surroundings carefully. The ship alarm is sounding. Look, ship. You see nothing special. Examine ship. <laughs> We're doing what we can. What about him? <laughs> what? All right, so we're already at the standstill of majority of text adventure games. But in 1981, the novelty of having the computer talk to you, I would be here trying as much as I could and continuing to uh, send out s signals and, 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 and different commands just to see if I can get anything to happen. Because th th this novelty of the computer talking to you would, would draw me in and make me want to continue to play the game. Or just to see what else is going to say back as, as, we're, as we're playing. Leave. Let's leave. Get out of here. What? I don't know how to leave. Of course not. All right, so there is an example of the very first talking adventure game we've ever played. Now, I would want to play uh, a little bit longer to see it talk to us, but it, this is the use that happens on text adventure games. You're going to be stuck at a certain point, and then you come back and play it later. Maybe try something different or think to yourself, wait, I could have said it this way or a different way. But uh, for the time, this one is not necessarily the best text adventure game. So if we took the talking away as the novelty and just said it was a text adventure game, it's it's okay. It's still around the same range as like a Scott Adams three, two and a half, three star uh, game around the average range. But um, because of the talking, uh, that one actually m makes you want to play more to see what else the game is going to say back at you. So I'm not going to push it that much higher. I'm, I'm still going to say three and a half stars. It's an above average game for the talking alone uh, and for the first that we've ever seen. It's so impressive. All right, and with that, we've reached the end of our evening. This time, we're going to put our game playing on pause. So many more games to go through for 1981. Having a blast. Really excited for 1982. As we continue the, the games going in order, in alphabetical order, we're going to be going, uh, we're now in T's, so we're, we are getting close. So close, you can smell it. So that's it for today, and like I always say, Super Cobra! Hey everybody, thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9pm Central, so join us and let us know if you miss any games along the way. This video would not be possible without RetroArch and LaunchBox. Please tell your friends there's some crazy guy out there trying to play every single video game. You can always check out Chronologically Gaming on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We will catch you next time.